Do you like your new job? The pilot asked me. To be honest, I loved my job at the laboratories, I replied. But it is nice to finally sit in the spaceships I've spent so long working on. My name is Robert Dykeman. I am a scientist. By the time I turned 30, I had designed and tested spaceships on three different planets of our galaxy. This was the first time I actually worked as a co-pilot on a mission. Admittedly, I was a little nervous, but I was grateful to be part of one of the most exciting types of jobs. I was on an exploratory ship with Captain Ramon Bravo. The ship was one of our best models. Practical. Incredibly fast. Surprisingly resourceful for its size. And the captain, well, it was an honor to work with him. Plus, he adored his job. Actually going out and exploring the universe around us is an underappreciated task nowadays. He told me with a nostalgic tone. Well, I shyly added, most things we'll see were already noticed by our satellites, Captain. He shook his head with amusement and toyed a little with the controllers in front of us. Satellites can't do everything. They only notice the things that they are programmed to notice. Right? Wouldn't you like to be... Surprised? His last word was accentuated by a frown on his face, and a red light starting to blink on our panels. <laughs> are you trying to scare me? I chuckled. I had designed ships like this one. I knew how scary a red light could be. It's not me. Ramon shook his head. Take a look. Our radar just stopped working. Radars can't stop working, I nervously retorted. That would leave us stranded in the middle of nowhere. Hopeless and helpless and with only a few hours to... Robert. The captain said my name firmly to shake me down from my panic. Focus. You know what you're doing. Look, the radars appear to be alright, but they just refuse to show what's ahead of us. I leaned forward to take a closer look and... He was right. The ship's radar were completely functional, showing everything around us. Except what was way ahead. It looked like a clear circle with the top just sliced off. There was nothing there. Maybe it's clashing with the satellite signal, Ramon wondered. But I shook my head. No, look, we left the last satellites behind a while ago. This means we're really in unexplored territory. <sighs> and the territory apparently doesn't want to be explored, Ramon whispered. Carefully, he made our ship move forward slowly, getting closer and closer to the source of the mysterious effect on our radar. But we couldn't see anything. Movement. Warmth. Radio signals. Depths. All our signals got cut off on that spot. It wasn't even blurry or a spot in the radars. It was a clean line slashing through our screens. It was... A wall. A wall? I mumbled and repeated myself so my partner could hear me. A wall. It's, it's like there's a wall blocking our path. Ramon laughed. It's... <laughs> it's space, Robert. He said. But I noticed the tension on his brow. There can't be walls. I don't see anything blocking. I don't see anything there. It's space as I've always seen it. Could it be a, a new type of matter? Something we can't notice. I wondered why I frantically tinkered with our controllers, trying to get as much information as possible. I can't tell how far this barrier goes or how long it is. I can't figure out anything about it. There's nothing there, the captain insisted. There can't be. You said it yourself. Our satellites have seen it all. Not all. Not this far, I replied. Bullshit, he barked. What are you suggesting? That this is the end of the universe? <laughs> Come on. He laughed bitterly. I could tell that the uncertainty and lack of explanation were driving him a little mad. He started moving the ship again. A little faster. A little less carefully. And his movements were jerky and less precise. Ramon. Captain. Please calm down. I tried to soothe him and slow down the ship, but it was useless. We reached the barrier and... We crashed. Lightly thanks to me pulling the brakes and the captain's quick reflexes despite his state of mind. But the fact remains, we had just crashed against an invisible wall. Our eyes weren't lying. After the front of our ship touched the invisible barrier, 
What we were seeing was an endless space blinked and blurred for a couple of seconds before steadying again. It wasn't space at all. It seemed to be some sort of projection, an image put over a physical obstacle on our path. Incredible, I said astonished. Impossible, the captain cried out. Our ship took the impact well. Despite our lights blinking and the alarms going off, nothing appeared damaged. Well, besides our conception of the universe. There was a long, intense pause where we both got lost in our troubled thoughts. <sighs> but finally, the captain asked me, Do you think... I mean, if this was a secret, they wouldn't have sent us both here. Right? I perfectly understood his point. No. I shook my head. I have a feeling we are the only two people aware of the existence of this wall. I started breathing heavily. I was panicking again, but this time the captain made no effort to stop me from rapidly darkening my thoughts. I also have a feeling that this wall was fabricated. It is not a natural presence. Someone or something outside of all norms of regulations created this. I know that you and I are completely alone. The nearest satellites might catch a distress signal, but it'll be too long before any sort of rescue could find us. We have absolutely no way of knowing what this wall is, why it's here, what's on the other side, and who or what put it there. My heart was beating out of my chest. My hands were shaking. I was sweating. I felt on the verge of a precipice. This was worse than a black hole. Still, Ramon caught the way I was holding something back. But, he tentatively prompted me, but I'm dying to figure out all those answers. I whispered. At first, he looked horrified by the mere suggestion. I couldn't blame him. I looked like I was seconds away from fainting. But I was a scientist that had literally just crashed against an impossible obstacle. The only thing on my mind was this invisible wall. Countless hypotheses in a desperate need to get to the other side of this problem. Metaphorically, and quite literally too. The captain started moving the ship backward and away from the wall. You are mad, he told me. You have absolutely lost your mind. We are lost alone in space, facing something unreasonable, impossible, unimaginable. And, and you want, he trailed off, thought about it for a second, and prepared the attack systems of the ship. Do you want to try something? His question definitely intrigued me. We barely thought twice about it. In a matter of seconds, we shot three quick blasts at the barrier. Once again, the image of the endless space blinked, ruining the illusion before restoring itself. I heard the captain groan in frustrations before we started shooting again. Our projectiles did little to no damage to the wall. But after a minute of this, the captain stopped so we could see the results. After the image steadied again, it wasn't the same. There were gray spots all over, like, like a ruined screen, some cracks here and there. The illusion was over. The wall wasn't invisible anymore. It was obvious. But the most obvious part, the thing that made both of us gasp in terror, were the words. Desist. The words appeared in giant red letters over the surface of the wall. They were so big the red light covered our entire ship. The letters were there for a second at most, but still, it was beyond ominous and it took our breath away. This was enough to make me lose my mind. The repercussions of that combination of letters was unmeasurable. This unthinkable wall in the middle of nowhere had just communicated with us. In English, signaling not only intelligent life behind it, but creator's knowledge of who and what we were. I couldn't resist. I took over the controls, fired up the ship's engines, and drove it forward as fast as it could go in that short distance. This time, the crash against the wall made our entire cabin shake. The lights flickered. The alarm started to ring loudly. Warning lights lit up all over the controls. Damage was done to our ship, but to the wall as well. There was a noticeable dent on the surface that made me grin. Are you crazy? Ramon asked me when he recovered from the shock. You could have killed us. This thing could explode or attack us. Or what else? I asked him. My partner frowns. 
or send another message. Or open up, eat us, make us disappear. Or not, he mumbled. His expression grew thoughtful, and when he looked me in the eyes, I noticed they were sparkling with curiosity. Or something could come out. I whispered back at him. Someone, people, monsters, hallucinations, planets, aliens, anything at all. The captain looked disturbed, and I had never been as scared or as excited as I was at that moment. We couldn't keep talking, though. The din I had caused on the wall started to tremble, and then one by one, little pieces of the wall started to fall off. They floated away in space slowly, weightless. Ramon and I watched marveled as the barrier broke down in front of us. We couldn't utter a word. By the time fear started to overpower all of our other feelings, it was way too late. At first, it looked like beyond the wall there was only empty space with stars in the distance. But the stars started to blink, and multiply, and move. And those were the eyes watching us. Dozens, hundreds of them. Bright as stars, but soulless and undoubtedly not human. We couldn't see anything else. Planets. Other constructions. One more word. There was nothing but those unblinking eyes staring at us from every angle. As the hole on the barrier continued to grow, the eyes started to move away, as if opening space for us. The captain glanced at me, and almost imperceptibly, I shook my head. It took us way too long, but we had finally regained what would remain of our senses and reason. There are limits you aren't meant to cross, even in the endless expanse of outer space. Ramon moved slowly, placed his hands on the controllers, and tried to move the ship backward. The damaged engines protested, and warning signs lit up on our entire cabin, but the ship moved, for a moment at least, because a second later everything stopped and then the ship started moving forward. Ramon scrambled to get the controls to do as he demanded, and from the co-pilot's seat, I imitated his movements desperately. The engines roared, but they were helpless. The ship wasn't moving on its own accord. We were being dragged forward. An invisible force was attracting our entire ship, closer and closer to the wall, until we were crossing it. We had no idea what we were entering, we knew nothing but its deep darkness and fortress we had just ruined. When our ship was fully on the other side of the wall, we stared at the screen showing us the space behind us, and we watched with tears in our eyes the way the wall rebuilt itself, locking us inside. The last thing I remember is an endless void speckled with sparks of light that blink as they study my every movement. <gasps> I come back to myself with a gasp. As I struggle to get my labored breathing under control, I take a look at my surroundings and review the facts. Everything around me is dark, except for a few lights still blinking on the control panel in front of me. I'm still strapped to my seat. Beside me, there's Captain Ramon Bravo, still passed out. My name is Robert Dykeman, and we made a terrible, terrible mistake. We were on an exploratory mission in space, and when we found the end of the satellite signal, we came across an unexpected barrier, a sort of invisible wall built in the middle of space. Our curiosity made us crash our ship against this wall, until we were dragged to the other side against our will. And then, my head starts to hurt and I close my eyes tightly. But when I open them again, I immediately scream. There, on the glass in front of me, there's a hand. Just a human hand, I think. Completely out of place. Completely impossible. Just resting there on the glass outside of our ship. I scream. And I scream until my throat feels like it's going to split wide open. And then I wake up. Again? Was that a dream? My mind is a scrambled mess. But if dreaming or not, I was so scared by a simple human hand out of place. 
What I'm seeing now is so unexpected that I'm stunned into complete silence. I'm afraid my brain is unable to process it. I'm scared this experience will give me a heart attack. But then I feel hands on my shoulders and a voice asking me. Robert. Robert. Are you okay? Hey. Breathe, please. I'm here with you. It's Ramon. My partner in this mission. He's wide awake now. His eyes go back and forth between my terror-stricken expression and the sight that's right outside our ship. I, I can't believe it. I can't understand. I mumble. All I can do is try to avoid looking for sense, logic, and reason. I have to accept what I'm seeing at face value for now. The thing is, out there, what we see outside our ship is just nature. It looks as if we had just dropped down in the middle of the most inconspicuous forest imaginable. It's so pretty and nearly perfect. It's as if it had come alive from a picture book for kids. But at the same time, it's so unremarkable that I can think of a hundred places like this one just in one of the planets I've been to before. It feels unfamiliar, and like I've been camping there a dozen times before. The feeling is unreal and brings goosebumps to my skin. What happened? I asked Ramon, though I already had a feeling he has to be as clueless as I am. Well, he says, it looks like something went wrong during takeoff and instead of leaving our planet, we only crashed down in the middle of some forest. His words immediately make me tense and I nearly jump off my seat. I can feel my heart accelerating. Feels on the edge of a precipice. Did I go mad? Was all of this a hallucination? The pure terror in my face must have alarmed my partner, because he puts a comforting hand on my shoulder and then he says, But that would be impossible, right? And you remember what happened. Please tell me you remember what happens. Of course I do, I reply. The wall, the entrance, the... the eyes. Look! Ramon turns his head away from me to look through the front glass of the ship. There, in the shadows between the trees and the darkness of the bushes, there are those brilliant little eyes like stars, blinking and staring directly at us. Fascinating. Ramon mumbles. D do you think we should go head out and explore further? Robert. Robert? Are you okay? When he turned toward me again, my friend noticed my state of distress. Seeing those eyes in the dark corners of the forest awoke a powerful memory I desperately tried to block or overcome through the years. I'm staring at the eerily familiar forest, and I remember being a lonesome kid running away from bullies during camp and getting lost in the forest. I see those unnatural eyes staring at us, vulnerable in our broken-down ship. And I remember the cold of the night, the hunger, the fear, and the glowing eyes of wild beast. Then, I feel the eyes getting closer and closer as if they could read my mind. We're supposed to be lost in space, miles away from the forest and pain. But still, my whole body aches with the phantom pain of feral animals biting through my flesh when I was only just a kid. Get me out of here! I yell. My brain distantly registers Ramon's worry and fear at my outburst, but I don't care. Get me out of here! Get me out of here! I can't do this again! I can't! The animals will eat me! They still want me! I know it! I've been here before! I see it in my nightmares and now I'm back! Please! God! Just get me away from here! My desperate, desperate cries must have unsettled my partner badly. But they work. Okay, okay. Calm down, Robert, please. He repeats again and again, trying to soothe me down while my body thrashes around on my seat and tears stream down my eyes. Ramon fights against the controls of the ship and the agonizing engines, but, but he gets the ship to start up. Calm down, Robert, please. Try to get a grasp of your mind. This is not the forest from your childhood, you're safe. This is, this is different. This is impossible. The ship starts to move, but as we should have maybe expected at this point, it doesn't happen as it should. We don't move forward. We don't move upwards. Instead, our ship starts moving in reverse, something it shouldn't be able to do. We are being dragged backwards 
away from the trees, away from the glowing eyes, faster and faster. We're falling. Put on your seatbelt. Ramon yells at me as he prepares himself on his own seat. There's a brief moment of pure silence, and it feels like we're back in space, completely suspended without gravity. And then, the splash. We've fallen onto a body of water, and we're sinking, quickly, unstoppably. In a matter of seconds, we're below the surface. And in a minute, we'll start losing sight of the light. I'm terrified out of my mind, obviously. I've barely recovered from that intense feeling of being back at the spot where I experienced my most intense childhood trauma. And we're thrown here, here. The memory strikes me all at once. A terrible experience I didn't live myself, but I heard coming from the lips and the tears of the man sitting beside me. Ramon starts screaming before I figure out what to do. No, no, not this, anything but this, damn it. He starts furiously slamming his hands on the control panel in front of him. He hits the buttons with desperation, and he jerks the controllers one way and another, doing anything and everything he can to get out of this situation. But it's hopeless. Ramon! Ramon, please, listen to me! Please, please, listen to me! We have to get out of here! I tell him. I try to reason with him, but there's no point. Even if he wasn't struggling against the suffocating grip of trauma, I have a feeling we still wouldn't be able to leave this sinking ship and swim to the surface in time. We're sinking so fast. It's getting so dark and so cold I can't stop shivering. Don't you get it? Ramon yells at me. I've been here before. I was only six years old and I was convinced I was going to die. I... I, I remember it now. It, it's just like this. I'm so cold. And there's so much pressure around me. And I'm sinking. Robert. I try to swim but something's dragging me down. I want to scream for help, scream for my parents, but that would kill me. As if I wasn't already dead, and I'm dying again. <laughs> the pure desperation in his voice makes tears fall from my eyes, and my body shakes. I can picture the terror of a little boy drowning during his first visit to a lake so clearly, and I ache for him. But now we're living his worst nightmare again, and I can't shake him out of it long enough for us to escape. You're not alone now, Ramon. You didn't die then, and, and you're not going to die now. I tell him at the same time I wrap my arms around him. I try to be as gentle as well as reassuring. But the truth is, I don't think we're going to make it out of this alive. Doom is closer than ever. This spaceship wasn't made to dive in the water. It's just a matter of time before the systems malfunction. A short circuit starts a fire, walls cave, water floods in. Anything could kill us now. Lack of oxygen that will dry our lungs up painfully. A fire or an explosion that will burn us alive bit by bit or all at once. Maybe the structure of the ship will crumble down around us, crushing our bodies to dust. Perhaps the water will get in and my friend's greatest nightmare will come true. The water will fill every dark corner of this room just like our lungs. And as the lights go off in every light bulb, so will die the light in our eyes. Eyes? Ramon whispered. I, I don't remember eyes before. He lifts his head from my shoulder and I look at the glass in front of us as well. We pull back from our embrace and stare at the wide expanse of water surrounding us. It's not at all dark anymore. There are those eyes again. Dozens. Maybe hundreds of them. They're showing up all around us. They shine so brightly. They blink slowly. They float on the darkness and stare directly at us. Suddenly, it's harder to breathe. I'm starting to shake. I feel all my muscles tense up. I'm so cold. I have goosebumps, and I'm once again convinced we're going to die. Are we dead already? I wonder. There's a horrified scream stuck in my throat, but I don't manage to speak a word. The eyes are getting brighter and brighter, bigger and bigger. I'm scared they are going to swallow us alive, take us into their light and eat our souls here in this endless and incomprehensible darkness we're in. Suddenly, for a brief second, all the eyes close, and we are consumed by darkness once more. But when they open again, the light is blinding. It's, it's so strong. It's an all-encompassing light and it burns. Ramon and I scream and try our best to shield our eyes. We squirm and fall to our knees as we continue to scream until I feel my eyelids getting really heavy. 
I succumbed to unconsciousness as darkness engulfed my vision. When I regain consciousness again, I'm more confused than I've ever been. There are so many sounds surrounding me. I can hear subtle voices. There's a pressure over my face. I try to move, but I'm somehow restrained. Finally, I manage to open my eyes. The surprise could have killed me. But after so many shocks in the last hour, I think my brain just couldn't afford to be immediately started. No. This time the fear starts somewhere at the back of my head like a feeble candlelight. Soon, it would grow into a massive forest fire that would take over my every thought. But first... Hey! You're awake! A stranger tells me as they look down on me. I blink, scared and look around me, looking for something that makes sense. They're pushing me forward on a gurney. There's a mask giving me oxygen. Blinking lights alert me of the presence of an ambulance. There's a big commotion all around me. And a few feet away, Ramon is in the exact same position as I am. Our ship is already far away from me. It's not in a forest. It's not in sinking water. It's not even floating in space. The ship is stationed in a professional and kind of familiar station. It's attached to a large mechanism like claws holding it firmly. It reminds me of the labs where I trained for this mission, the space simulators. The confirmation that the forest, as well as the water, had been a simulation makes me feel sick. Apologies for making you go through all that, the person, whom I assume to be a paramedic, tells me, but I turn my head to the side to avoid looking at them. I, I can't bear it. It's an automatic defense mechanism, they tell me. A little peek into your subconscious with a scan, fabricating an illusion of a significant scene from your past. Well, it proves to us that you're humans. It's just a little precaution, you know? Aliens have been knocking on our walls for a millennia. But, uh, you're one of us, right? You might just be a little sick, uh, aren't you? I'm, I'm just one of them, aren't I? Ramon and I just got a little lost. We're just a little sick, aren't we? Except, when they get me inside of the ambulance, they hook me up to a different machine I've never seen before. And a sour smell immediately invades my senses. I don't know if it's poison or if it's anesthesia. I don't know if this is a different race or a different dimension. All I know is that before I lose all consciousness, I finally focus on the face of the nurse talking to me. And the last thing I see in her eyes, her body and face are that of a completely normal and ordinary woman. But her, but her eyes, glowing eyes like little stars that observe me and let me know for sure that whatever this is, this isn't my home. My name is Logan Davis. I'm a mechanic, just like my dad before me and my grandfather too. When I was just five years old, passing my dad his tools as he repaired cars in front of our house, I never imagined I would have reached the places I have. But here I am, after a lifetime of hard work, good friends that offered great opportunities, and becoming a real expert in certain types of engines. I am boarding a spaceship for the first time in my life. I stand in awe in front of the giant structure that is meant to take me and several other people into space. The thought brings chills to my entire body, but at the moment, I'm merely excited. There are nerves, of course, but I don't feel fear. Not yet, at least. I have no idea I'm a few hours away from experiencing terrors that no human should ever experience. My thoughts are interrupted by a strong arm falling around my shoulders. It's the captain of the ship, Marcus. He tells me, What? Are you scared, kid? Don't worry. All first-timers pee their pants on the first day. <laughs> he laughed as he walked away, bumping shoulders with his co-pilot. I try to laugh as well, pretend that this is just friendly banter and it only means that I fit in with the crew. But that's all lies. I watch as the onboard doctor and the pair of scientists that will be dropping off at the space station walk past me without sparing a glance. Unlike the head engineer, when she passes by, she does look at me. But there's nothing but pure disgust and resentment in her eyes. Apparently, her daughter had been studying for years to get the job I have. 
I might not come from some fancy university, but I am confident in my knowledge and her nasty looks don't affect me. Not much. The only other person left is Andre, another engineer, but from a lower level. <laughs> Closer to me than the other smug knucklehead people walking ahead of us. We were the brute force. Hired to do the hard work and keep the engines running. Andre arrives at my side and affectionately slaps my back. He grins and asks me, Hey, Logan, what do you say when we make it up there, we just let those idiots fall off the ship? <laughs> Let's do this. I followed him into the ship, feeling more confident on my feet and ready to start this adventure with a smile on my face. I don't think about Andre's words again for a long time. The ignition goes well, the takeoff is perfect. And we cross the atmosphere of planet Earth. Just seamlessly. Everything goes perfectly fine until the moment the captain announces that we're on a steady course and allowed to wander the ship and get to work on our respective stations. It takes less than an hour for things to go wrong. That's all it takes for me to remember Andre's words. Idiots falling off the ship. It's starting to look a lot like the ship is trying to get rid of us. The darkness is so sudden that, for an instant, I fear I've died. Then, I hear a couple of screams, which makes it worse. I feel the ship tremble for a few seconds, and the panels of the walls around us rattle all over our heads. My heart skips a beat, and then the lights come back on, I think. But there's something wrong. They start to flicker, on and on, slowly at first, then faster and faster, like the beating of a panicking heart. And finally, an explosion, dozens of them, all over the ship. The lights explode one after the other. The glass breaking flies everywhere. The sparks leave burns all over the ceilings. Again, shrill screams all around me and absolute darkness. Slowly, the emergency lights turn on and it's almost worse. These red lights are built considerably stronger than the regular ones and I know both kinds inside out. That's why I'm so worried. I know perfectly well that for these lights to explode like this, they need a very sudden and extremely high charge of energy. Something that's far from expected irregularities. No, there's something deeply wrong with our ship right now. I don't have any time to lose. I had been on the storage room fetching a set of tools for Andre when this happens. So now I run all the way back to the engines room. The broken shards of glass from the lights crunches under my boots, and the red emergency lights flicker ominously over my head. Something stops me halfway through. One of the hallway's doors is locked, and I can hear the engineer, Tanya, screaming from the other side. Help! Help! Is there anybody out there? She yells angrily. Tanya! Tanya, it's me, Logan. Are you okay? I ask her. She replied with a very annoyed tone. Of course I'm not okay. The lights are out. The doors are locked and I can't make my way out. I struggle against the locks on the door, but it's useless. Without energy on the ship, we need to pretty much dismantle the controls besides the door to open it up. Tanya, I'm going to look for Andre and we'll come back with our tools, okay? I tell her. Before I get too far, she calls my name and gives me a warning. Logan, Logan, listen to me very closely. It should be impossible for the ship to lose power like this. There's something terribly wrong with our engines. An emergency like nothing we were prepared for. The distribution of oxygen won't last long. You need to bring me my suit and open these doors. You useless grease monkey. Now! I don't bother replying. I start running. I have a front row seat to the effects this power outage has on the ship. Doors are halfway shut. Wires are falling from the ceiling where the lights used to be and sending sparks flying that I do my best to avoid. In one of the hallways, I finally glimpse a different kind of light, a flashlight being pointed right at my face, two figures walking towards me. Logan, the captain asked me, what the hell happened? What did you do? <laughs> me? I have no idea what- What kind of mechanic we have on board? The captain interrupts me. If you don't even know what went wrong, 
I took a deep breath to force myself to calm down. Fighting amongst ourselves is not going to solve this crisis, even if I'm the only one that seems to know it. So I share with my crewmates what I know. This is a very grave situation, guys, I tell them. I found Tanya, and she's locked in one of the hallways. I'm going to need specialized equipment to unlock the door. But first, she told me we should get all our suits on. The oxygen might not last long with a few this severe in our system. Jesus Christ! The captain groans and rubs the bridge of his nose. All right, let's do this. It's going to be okay. I'll make sure of it. His promise sounded quite empty. I believe. He could be the captain. But only Tanya, Andre, and I could solve a problem this big with the power of the ship. Either way, we started running towards the area where our suits were. The journey isn't easy. The failure in the system leaves doors half open that we have to squeeze through, and one or two that relentlessly opens and closes, threatening to cut one of our limbs off. The co-pilot is caught in one of them, and she's lucky to keep her right arm. But the blood, there's a big cut on her shoulder, and her screams are still ringing in my ears. Just like the metallic smell of her blood fills my nostrils and makes the overall state of the ship much worse. She's going to need stitches, urgently. Otherwise, her suit will be a worthless effort. We agree to search for the doctor as soon as our suits are on, but that's when we hear someone yelling our names. Logan? Captain? Tanya? Logan? It's Andre. I feel a great relief knowing he's alive. Together, I'm certain we can fix any of the problem that's destroying our ship. But my relief is short-lived because I caught the urgency and fear in Andre's voice. The three of us start yelling until he reaches us. I almost don't want to see him knowing he won't be bearing good news. The emergency lights flicker above us. The ship trembles once more. The bad omens take my breath away. You guys have to come with me, Andre says reasonably foregoing any small talk. The doctor is in the infirmary, and I, I can't open the door. And, and, what? What? The captain yells loudly at my friends. There's a fire! Andre yells right back. The captain and his co-pilot immediately run to the infirmary, fixing their suits as they go. I grab Andre's arm tightly to keep him from following them. I'll go. I tell him, put on your suit and meet us there. We don't even know how much more oxygen we have left. After receiving a nod and a confident smile from my friends, I feel stronger, braver, ready to face whatever we have in front of us. But as I probably should have expected, I was wrong. I started running in the direction of the infirmary. Before arriving, I'm already hearing the doctor screams. She's yelling at the top of her lungs. She sounds in incredible pain, and I can hear desperate banging on the door. But I know what a locked door means in these circumstances. When I reach the infirmary, I'm paralyzed. The shock seizes my body, and I watch helplessly. The captain and the co-pilot are trying to take down the locked door, while the doctor is... The doctor is being burned alive inside. Through the small window at the top of the door, I can see the flames dancing, and the doctor's burnt hand knocking with the last of her strength. It's fucking hell. I am convinced we're in hell. Do something! The captain tells me as soon as he notices my presence. Do something! His yelling snaps me out of my shock, but all I can do is shake my head. The... There's nothing I can do, I whisper. This man is desperate. He grabs me by the shoulders and shakes my body roughly. But it's helpless, and I tell him so. It's useless, Captain. Even if I had my tools, there's no time. We can't save her. Just then, we hear the co-pilot scream. She flinched away from the locked door. The heat was too much to bear, and there were burnt marks on her suit, but even more concerning... Her wound was leaking badly, and the red stains on her white suit made me nauseous. This could kill her, and quickly. But before we could figure out something else to do, 
There's another scream coming from nearby. Andre! I exclaim and run off to follow his cries for help. I notice the captain and co-pilot follow me, but we don't make it very far. There, in the middle of one of the hallways, it's the most horrifying scene I've ever seen. The two scientists that had been on board with us lie dead on the floor. There's a pool of blood around them, a gruesome open wound in the throat of one of them, and on the back of the other one. It's as if a beast had clawed its way inside their bodies. The co-pilot throws up. She looks on the verge of fainting. The captain looks pale too. Is, is there a chance? You know, I try to ask, but there is no way to put my question into words without sounding half crazy. Captain, do you think something alive could have done this? Something from somewhere other than our planet? I see the captain gulp nervously, but he doesn't reply. Instead, he grabs me and the co-pilot and moves us forward. We have to go. Emergency shuttles. Now. He orders. But, but Tanya. I mumble. It's useless as well. On our way to the emergency shuttles, we pass by the hallway where she was locked in. There's a puddle of blood coming from under the door. Something other than lack of oxygen must have killed her. We really are in hell and we have to escape, quickly. However, and this shouldn't have surprised me, I am left behind. When we arrive at the escape pods, we remember only two people fit in each of them. There's not even a discussion about it. The co-pilot is barely conscious. The captain sends me a solemn nod. And then the two of them enter the first pod, abandoning me. I can leave by myself. I can but the last straw of their disrespect towards me hits like a ton of bricks. I told you, we had to let this ship people fall off the ship. I turn around hastily when I hear that voice behind me. It's Andre. He's standing there, a toolbox at his feet, a saw in his hands, the kind we used to cut through metal on the ship. Most of his suit is splattered with blood. Our crewmate's blood. Oh my God. You didn't do this. I sigh. I can feel my entire body tremble with the realization. Every moment Andre was missing. Every one of his resentful comments. Everything clicks. Everything makes sense. Yes, Logan. And you feel the same, don't you? I know you do. Andre nods again. This time his smile makes me sick. He really believes this. He doesn't even feel remorse. Behind us, the emergency shuttle had already taken off, but it only takes a moment to explode into a million little pieces on fire, including the bodies of the last two members of our crew. We'll go home as heroes, Logan. Everyone's finally going to respect us, Andre tells me. The psychopath wraps an arm around me and pats me on the back. If he's the one that ruined our ship, then that means we can fix it. No, Andre, I whisper. You are not going back home. He's so confident I agree with him. And he's so content, basking in the glory of his horrifying crimes, that he doesn't react in time. I grab his hand with both of mine and drive the saw directly into his throat. When he falls to the floor, I stab him again and again. The blood splatters all around us, all over me. The monster is dead. But I'm a killer now too, and I don't even know if I can fix this ship by myself. <sighs> but I reassure myself by repeating again and again, the only truth I know, the only monster of the ship is now dead. Day 234 in Space Station Quasar III, First Inspection. My name is Dr. Marcus Lee, American, 46 years old, specialist in space mineralogy. 
It's been exactly 12 hours since I've checked the progress of the experiments. Capsules number one, two, and three have failed to produce oxygen again, and the living specimens in it have perished again. Um, capsules four to eight continue to show absolutely zero signs of a positive nor negative reaction. The several different combinations of gases, liquids, solids from planet Earth and other planets have not successfully interacted in any significant way. Capsules 9 to 15, uh, uh, the materials from Earth were destroyed. The levels of destruction range from 45% to 99%. Once again, I'm labeling the materials as highly toxic and unfit for transporting back to Earth. Um, and that's it. I will replace the failed experiments with new tests and I'll return to give an update in exactly 12 hours from now. End of report. <sighs> I groaned with exhaustion as I finished the recording. And when I leaned back heavily on the chair, it echoes the sound with its tired hinges, and the creaking of the chair echoes in the empty room, out toward the hallways, and probably spreads all over Quasar III, like an eerie sign of life, as I was already a ghost, hunting myself. I'm the only person in this station somewhere in space, and I've been alone for 234 days and counting. The only reason I haven't lost my mind is because I've trained extensively for this my entire life. It's not even the first time I'm in space. It's only been the longest I've been entirely alone. My job in this station is to develop a series of experiments that consist of studying materials from other planets, especially the way they react with materials from our planet Earth. The goal is to figure out the levels of safety, possible uses, and kind of dangers that humanity could find on these planets. The reason why these experiments are conducted here in a space station is to avoid taking the extraterrestrial elements to our planet and risking not only a lethal error occasioned by something as simple as a tiny leak of oxygen, but as far as we know, a successful experiment could result in the elements creating something catastrophic for the entire human race. There is a reason why this station is called the third. Tragedies have happened before, unfortunately. Obviously, I would like to avoid a catastrophe and survive this mission safe and sound. However, there are only so many failed tests a scientist can stand before we go out of our way to make something happen. Anything, good or bad. But if I don't make two things react in some way soon, I will genuinely lose my mind. I don't care about the loneliness. I don't mind the infinity of space and my undeniable insignificance. What I can't bear is to sit here, day after day, and let these precious materials go to waste because we're too scared to do more than the bare minimum. Every day, I hesitate, and every day, I decide against saying something in my voice recordings, but I haven't been completely honest. There is a 16th capsule, and it's always been kept completely empty, until now. I chose a small piece of rock from a random planet, something that doesn't resemble the Earth too much, to keep things interesting, but nothing too unfamiliar, to minimize the probabilities of unpleasant surprises. However, for a full week now, I've been playing with it, experimenting with new off-the-books methods to make it interact with elements from our planet, and still no results. <sighs> Yesterday, I lost my patience. I did something that hasn't been tried before in the long history of this project. I forgot about earthly elements. I combined two extraterrestrial materials. I exposed this piece of rock to a liquid substance obtained from an asteroid. I let it rest for the mandatory 12 hours. And then, to my absolute delight, I found the liquid had disappeared and the rock had disintegrated to a very thin powder. Finally! About fucking time! Okay, look, I know the right thing would be to record the results of the experiment. It could be a valuable lesson for the future, or, in the worst case scenario, a life-saving warning. But I can't bring myself to do it. If this turns out wrong, 
but not bad enough to keep me from facing the consequences. These would be bad. I would lose everything. And I'm not ready for that. It's not worth it. Well, not yet. If I'm going to lose everything for one experiment, then I better make it worth it. I have to push the batteries just a little more. I have to... Hmm, not quite sure what to do. I debate with myself and I pace the length of the entire station several times before coming up with a plan. The first step is relatively easy. Uh, I'll just toy with this new element. I'll heat it up and lower the temperature. I'll try pressure, friction, electricity, and then we'll go for earthly elements. Now if all else fails, I guess I'll repeat the process of introducing other extraterrestrial materials. After all, these capsules are created with the strongest, safest materials humanity has ever created. I couldn't be safer standing on the other side of the glass. Alright, I'm counting on you. Give me something good. That's what I whisper to that minuscule accumulation of pale orange sand. I have a lengthy list of steps to follow until I get this new element to react. I could have never imagined that the first thing I did would create the most unexpected, dangerous, yet fascinating reaction imaginable. There's no time to think, no time for me to consider reasons, search for explanations or try to protect myself. It's as simple as pushing one button. I only increased the temperature of the capsule one degree, just one degree. The effect is immediate. The ship starts to tremble. The sand is sparkling like tinder, flying all over the capsule. I'm afraid it's about to catch fire or even explode. Then there's something like lightning crossing the length of the capsule. And for a second, all I see is endless, endless darkness. That's when the glass separating me from that violent reaction is suddenly hit by a flurry of rocks. It's a storm of maddening proportions. Rocks of all shapes, sizes, and colors hit the glass at full speed. My body is attacked by a tremor. Everything happens so quickly. I can't scream, I can't run. I have only one second to fear the glass will break and I'll die here regretting this decision on my last breath. Then I manage to push a different button. As soon as the capsule returns to its original temperature, there's a new strike of lightning so bright it almost blinds me and everything is over. The calm that follows afterward leaves me shaking. It's like the violence has left the capsule and taken residence inside my mind. I fall to my knees and work very hard for a few minutes to get my breathing under control. I spend the next several hours analyzing what the hell had happened but I have trouble believing the results of my analysis. The capsule is half filled with countless rocks that entered out of nowhere in a storm. And according to the test I ran, those rocks perfectly match those found in the rings surrounding a nearby planet that closely resembles Saturn in our solar system. I'm talking about a completely identical match. I suppose it's not impossible in our infinite universe, but this is incredible. I've also studied a video recording of the moment this phenomenon happened. The speed at which these rocks invaded the station is also exactly the same speed the rocks, asteroids, and moons orbit this previously mentioned planet. I can't explain it. I simply know the truth. These new elements created a portal that brought these rocks inside a space station. The magnitude of this discovery brings me to tears, but I'm buzzing with energy and unable to stay still. I have to try again. There's no time to lose. There's only a limited amount of the rock we extracted from that random planet, and I would like to know as much as I can about this phenomenon before letting the rest of humanity know about the impossible becoming possible. There's only one problem. I'm consumed by a bone-chilling thought. Part of my fear is due to the fact that I'm all alone and vulnerable against this new phenomenon, but my fear only grows as my test continues because the next portal doesn't open up in the same place. They never do. I have no idea what to expect and no way to control it. And I'm forced to see things so magnificent and horrifying that I know for a fact I'll devote myself to this experiment until I die. Because at that moment, I can't ever picture myself going to sleep ever again. Two more tests leave me thoroughly disappointed. 
finding only empty space on the other side of the portal. This break allows me to take a breath, make annotations, and make sure I'm still alive and in one piece. And I'm glad I enjoyed this moment because it'll be the last instant of peace I'll ever know. One of the tests fills the capsule with water. The liquid crosses the portal so fast, so aggressively, that by the time I turn down the temperature to close the portal, there are only a few inches of space left. My heartbeat skyrockets, thinking of what could have happened if I, if I let the water pressure go up and up until it swallows the entire station. My studies reveal that this is nearly perfectly normal water, but it's not from Earth. It could sustain life on the planet it comes from, but I have no way of knowing what planet it was, and no way to open the portal again in the same place. The curiousness of all of it nearly drives me mad. I feel so unsettled that on the next attempt, I hastily turn up the temperature 2 degrees, and I'm barely surprised by the lightning that's twice as bright, the portal that's twice as big, and the absolutely insane blast of hot lava that crosses the portal at breakneck speed. I turn down the temperature, but not without burning the tip of my finger with the incredible heat radiating all over the capsule. This experiment is going to kill me, and I've never felt more exhilarated in my life. This is it. This is what I've been training for. The lava needs time to settle, to be studied and cleansed, so I take the impulsive decision to empty all other capsules. I throw away all the unnecessary tests. This is all that matters now. This is everything to me. And soon, it's going to be everything to the rest of humanity too. The portals open up one by one. They bring me asteroids and fill the capsules with gas. They show me walls of solid eyes of unmeasurable depths and a raging fire that peeks inside a capsule to lick the walls of glass and warm me. I think I'll be consumed by these portals soon if I'm not careful. The rocks that provide me with the delicate yellow sand that creates space portals are quickly running out. I have a feeling that if the portals don't kill me, I'll kill myself if I can't keep studying them. It is, however, a nearly impossible task. I have lost track of time and I still don't know much more about the portals than I did after accidentally op opening up the first one. Still, nothing could have prepared me for opening up a portal and seeing nothing but green grass on the other side. And then, a toy car comes through the portal, flying weakly at the glass wall separating us and falling to the floor, leaving me completely puzzled. I'm... I'm exhausted. I'm probably insane. I am unstoppable, and I'm a very stupid person that didn't understand what was happening until it was too late. Right after the toy comes a little boy, a toddler, through the portal. No! I yell loudly as I punch the glass. The boy is stunned and struggling to breathe in the environment of the capsule, but through the portal comes enough clean air to keep him alive. I haven't recovered from the surprise of seeing a human safely cross the portal when the little boy's eyes fill with tears and he starts sobbing. No, 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 come on, go back, just go back, cross the portal. I scream and repeatedly hit the glass wall separating me from the boy, but it's useless. If anything, he looks even more scared when he sees me. I sigh gravely. I know it's impossible and unreasonable to keep him here with me. And I'm aware that I have to return him to Earth before my unstable brain starts to consider including him in the experiments. I ask myself what's one more crazy thing to do among all this chaos. And then I enter the capsule. The fresh air from home coming from the portal feels good, but makes me very, very dizzy after weeks of being locked in a space station. Come on, kid. Just get close to the portal, okay? Let, let's take you back home, alright? I tried to reason as I rubbed my temples, willing the impending headache to give me just a minute, but the stupid boy won't stop sobbing. Stop it! I yell, yanking the boy's arm. My heart clenches as I see the fear in his innocent eyes. With another sigh, I gently start to guide him forward, pushing him delicately until every hair in my body stands on end at the proximity of the portal. At the very last second, when I'm about to push him through, the boy reacts in fear and pulls me along with him. I could have resisted, but this burst of clean air hit my senses hard enough to make me sick. Helplessly, I cross the portal along with the little boy. I fall down on the soft grass. Distantly, I hear the cries of a mother running forward to take her son in her arms. Vaguely, I notice the blades of grass floating around me toward the portal. But then, 
Everything becomes too real to ignore. The boy and his mother run away, and the kind man drags me away before I'm sucked through the portal again. A big chunk of soil floats up toward the portal, and before I'm taken away from that completely random and previously innocuous backyard, I catch a glimpse of a tree starting to come off the ground, getting sucked by the portal. And towards space, I created this portal. I opened it up on the exact planet I was meant to protect, and now there's nobody on the other side there to close it. The entire planet could be about to be dragged through a space portal. And that's when my body collapses in exhaustion and leaves me unconscious. There was something strange showing up on our radars, and I didn't like it at all. I had all my focus on the controls of the ship. I had made a promise to take this crew back home safely, and I intended to keep it. Now that our exploratory mission was over, I just needed to avoid any inconveniences, and we would be able to call it a success. Then why on earth was I staring at a blinking red dot in the margin of one of those radars? It, it didn't make any sense. It wasn't any identifiable planet, nor any sort of asteroid on the move. And there was nothing else supposed to be around here. As if there had been any doubts in my mind about what I was seeing, my co-pilot, Ella, called my name from the seat next to mine. Captain Steven, are you seeing this? She wondered. I am. I nodded curtly. Please, get me more information on the object. On it, Ella replied. She acted quickly, running a few scans, activating additional features on our radars, and sending a sign to the rest of our crew. Then she asked me, Can we get closer to it, Captain? Negative. I shook my head. It's off our course. Ella hummed thoughtfully, and I knew she didn't like my answer. But then she proceeded to give me as much data as she could. Every new piece of information was worse than the last. It's been confirmed it's not a planet, nor any kind of asteroid known to us. There's little to no movement, no force of gravity, no direction. It is merely floating. The shape is unidentifiable from this far, but it must be just slightly larger than our ship. There's a small sign of heat from this object, but I can't know more until we move closer. I tighten my fist around the controls of the ship, trying to come up with a reasonable explanation. But then the door of our cabin opened up, and the two remaining members of our crew entered, both engineers that kept the mechanics matters of our ship in peak conditions during the entirety of our journey. I know what it is. The first engineer Adam called out with a proud smile, still wiping some black oil from his hands with a rag. It can't be an old satellite. It's too big. It has to be the Trident. Just the name was enough to make a chill run through our bodies. Adam's voice trembled. Ella let out a small gasp, and I had to clear my throat in a poor attempt to hide any shock. Only Joshua, the last member of our crew, remained unaffected. So what? He smirked as he leaned his back against the wall of the cabin. Ships fall all the time. Just because this 20-year-old piece of trash is still floating around doesn't make it interesting. I say we should move on. I say we should move on. Show some respect! I snapped back at him and stood up from my seat. What happened at the Trident was a tragedy. The crew abandoned the ship during an emergency. But they were all dead by the time the escape pods arrived on Earth. This is not a laughing matter. This is one of the darkest pieces of history in our universe. And we'll never find out the truth of what made them want to escape in the first place. I was confident my words had caused the desired effect of respect and a small spark of fear intended. But nothing would have prepared me for the words I heard next. We could, Ella said timidly at first, and then brimming with something I believed to be morbid curiosity. We could find out the truth now. We are a short distance away from the ship and we have sufficient supplies for a detour. We could. No. <sighs> I sighed heavily and dropped myself back down on my seat. This was none of our business, was it? Come on, Steven. I, I mean, Captain, Adam insisted. You know that two of the members of the crew didn't even make it back to Earth dead or alive. Don't you wanna... 
Bring the bodies of the heroes back home? Adam smiled, and I shook my head fondly at him. I knew he was trying to tempt me, but it wasn't enough. Not until Joshua spoke up again. Haven't you heard the stories? He asked, and his expression had changed. I couldn't tell if he was messing with us, or if he was truly and irrecoverably scarred. The bodies that arrived on Earth were frozen with an expression of inhumane terror in their cold blue faces. There's a theory that says they didn't die on the journey back home. Their lifeless bodies were put on the escape pods and sent away as a warning. And that's why nobody bothered to investigate further into the Trident. Because two members of the crew went crazy and murdered their partners. And they're probably waiting for us there, ready to defend their territory. There was a tense silence afterward. The four of us exchanged uneasy looks. I'm certain we were all thinking the same thing. What could possibly happen to a person to make them turn against their team? And could it happen to one of us? I couldn't allow this sort of thought to take roots in our mind. I had to get my crew back under control. Bullshit. I said at the same time I started adjusting the course of our ship. The Trident is nothing more than an old derelict ship, and nothing could survive 20 years there. I will prove to you that there is nothing to be scared of, and we will bring those bodies back home to their families, so they can finally find the peace they deserved. In less than an hour, the four of us were standing on the gates between both ships. We all had our suits, oxygen supply, high quality communication systems that allowed us to hear each other, and any outside threat that might come our way. Then, we jumped right in. The first step was the first bad sign. As soon as our boots, conditioned to give us a sense of gravity in the ships, touched the floor of this abandoned place, the entire structure groaned and whined like a wounded beast. It shook so hard it nearly threw all of us off balance. Instinctively, we clutched each other's arms to stay together until the trembling passed. Maybe the ship doesn't want us here, Joshua said. I think maybe Adam or Ella tried to argue with him and his ominous words, but I didn't even want to listen. I started marching forward, knowing they would have to follow me. But nothing, absolutely nothing, was about to go as planned. The ship was a mess, to say the least. After 20 years of abandonment, every single thing was broken, falling off, somehow burned, frozen, or, or melted. It was simply to... It was impossible to try and guess what kind of horrors had destroyed this ship this way for two decades. But we didn't have to imagine the results. The ceiling and walls threatened to fall down on us, and still, we heard it all so clearly. The footsteps, the dripping of some liquid, and something, or someone breathing inside this derelict ship with us. At one point, Ella put her hand on my arm and asked me, uh, Are you sure there was no way something could have survived 20 years here? No, I replied. Absolutely no one could do that. Back then, my brain didn't make the important distinction between something and someone. I knew that our colleagues had to be dead. I didn't imagine that something other than human could be in that spaceship with us. We were just exploring the broken ship with our flashlights, but tension was running high. As if my own rapid heartbeat wasn't enough, I was subject to listening to my partner's heavy breathing through the comms. It was distracting. All I know is that one moment we were rounding a corner, and the next, there was a person standing in the hallway with us. He was standing on his toes, barely touching the ground. His posture was so stiff, he was nearly bending backwards, and I feared his spine would break. His suit was raggedy, filthy and stained beyond recognition, and his helmet was missing. But he was right there, long hair, bare, open eyes, and sickeningly green skin. He wasn't breathing at all. He couldn't be alive. Could he? What the fuck? Adam whispered. Should we do something? Ella added. None of us had time to react. That wasn't a survivor, and it wasn't a ghost. Much like the spaceship, that human body was an abandoned vessel, and it was infected with something vile. Suddenly, the body started spasming violently, 
until it spurted out something dark green that glittered under the light from our flashlights. We all flinched away, but the sinister looking goo continued to pour out for an unnaturally long time. My team was screaming desperately, and I could swear there were giant spiders moving out of that disgusting liquid, coating the walls and floor of the ship. That was nothing humanity was prepared to deal with, but if it had kept that body from decomposing for 20 years, I didn't want to know what happened to the other one. Abort mission! I yelled. Get back to the ship! The four of us started running as far as we could, until we couldn't hear that explosion coming from that poor body suspended in the dark, until something crashed against my feet and knocked me down. My team stumbled too, and we had to scramble to our feet as quickly as possible. When we gathered ourselves and aimed our flashlights frantically in every direction, we finally hit the soulless glow of a pair of eyes. There was the other body. Not alive. Not quite human. It was dragging itself across the floor at surprising speed. Almost like a snake. While we heard the cracking of the bones and the head lolled lifelessly from side to side, as if it was worth nothing. We continued to scream and ran back to our ship. At that moment of crossing over, that thing, that infected and invaded corpse continued to chase us. But this one, other than being astoundingly disturbing, didn't attack. I pushed my team forward and I turned around with a growl ready to protect them with my life if necessary. That monstrosity slithered full speed toward me and I kicked and I kicked. I heard bones breaking. I heard the splashing of blood and I still continued to kick until merciful pairs of arms dragged me back onto my own ship. The four of us lay on the ground exhausted and terrified, with tears filling our eyes and falling down our cheeks for the longest time. But we were alive. We survived. That much was undeniable. Our boots were stained with that horrendous and inexplicable flesh and guts. My pants were covered with ugly blood stains and something as green as the vomit. But the worst part? The worst part was Joshua asking with a trembling voice. Captain? Do you think we'll make it back to Earth alive? Hey Cosmic Beings, it's Keon, director of the Dark Cosmos. Enjoy tonight's sci-fi horror story, and remember, stay cosmic. I remember the day I died, to my family, my friends, and myself. I saw a tombstone in a graveyard with my name engraved on it. I died six years ago when I embarked on my first and my last space mission. The journalist looked perplexed. I could see the confusion on his face. He didn't understand what I was talking about. Perhaps he may never understand. Of course, I wasn't dead. I was right in front of him, but he didn't understand. To him, I was crazy. They all didn't believe me when I told them what had happened to me and the rest of my crew. They probably just wanted some information for their newspapers and magazines. He, he saw me as the crazy guy who survived the Yugo space mission. They wanted to know what had happened to the rest of my team and how I made it back to Earth. I had told them the truth several times, but they still don't believe me. <sighs> It's been six years, and the world doesn't even remember anymore. Our sacrifices and memories have been lost in the dark cosmos. It was meant to be a one-year mission, but I spent three years in a strange world. It didn't feel like three years, but when I returned to Earth, the calendars said so. I don't even know how I survived. It, it feels like a dream. My son thinks I abandoned him. Besides, 
I can't offer him anything anymore. Not with the way I am right now. Kevin is in college now and he moved on with life, but I suddenly returned and he does not want to be reminded of his past. It must have been difficult for him. Six years, alone. I finally return and here I am in a mental clinic. <laughs> I should never have gone for the space mission. He had lost his mother shortly before I embarked on the mission and he searched for someone to hold on to in a world spinning out of control. All I could feel was regret and pain. I was lost in thought when the door flung open. A familiar voice echoed throughout the room. Leave us! It was Kevin. The journalist stood up abruptly and rushed out of the room. He had not visited me for months. I wondered why he had decided to come. Kevin strolled towards me and crouched right beside me. I want to know everything. Those were the words that escaped his lips. He stared right into my eyes. He seemed disturbed about something. I want to know what happened. Kevin was anxious. I drew closer to him and wrapped my arms around him as hot tears flowed down his cheeks. I searched my thoughts for the right words, but I couldn't find any. He was hurting. The doctor said I was suffering from post-traumatic stress disorder and I have been in a mental clinic since I returned from space three years ago. The nightmares have plagued my nights and hallucinations during the day, but when I stared at Kevin cry right in front of me, I was broken once again. I'm not sure if you would believe me, Kevin. I had told several people about my experience in space, but they seldom believed me. <laughs> Most of them laughed and mocked me. They all called me names and said I was crazy. I don't care. He sobbed softly. I just want to know. He continued. I breathed hard and prepared myself once again to narrate my ordeal. These memories have haunted me for years, leaving large scars open and reminding me of what had happened. I stood up and strolled towards the corner in my room as Kevin watched in confusion. I had hidden it from everyone's eyes until now. It looked unearthly and it was the only piece of memory I had brought back with me. I returned to my seat, holding the piece of alien technology tightly in my hands. I hoped and prayed that Kevin was going to believe me. I wanted to tell him everything. <sighs> it was on New Year's Eve, I began, and shifted my gaze to Kevin. He listened anxiously. I had not asked him why he had changed his mind, but I didn't care. I continued anyway. I wanted to tell him everything. I wanted him to know what had happened. Perhaps this was the only way I could finally leave again. I received a call that I had been selected for the Hugo space mission. I could remember how ecstatic I was. Hundreds had battled for a spot on the spaceship and I had been chosen as part of the five-man team. Every astronaut yearned for that position. I felt proud, son. As I spoke further, it seemed like I was reliving the memory. I could remember every single detail clearly. For the first time in a long time, I let everything go and continued to reminisce on the adventure. I decided to be a little bit dramatic. I had not felt such peace in a while and I drifted into oblivion. My lips narrated my tale but I felt as though it was happening all over again. Patches of snow decorated the balcony as I stared at the starry skies throughout the night. Sleep had evaded my eyes and I waited for dawn. My heart raced faster than normal. It was my first space mission, Kevin. I was the only newbie on the team. Everyone else on the team had embarked on at least one previous space mission, so they knew the drill. I was anxious to stare at the earth from above and bask in childlike yonder. Our mission was simple. A few astronauts had successfully flown to Mars and built a station there a few months ago. It was a huge breakthrough in the world of science. Our mission was to check up on them, restock some items, deliver a few new pieces of equipment, and return to Earth. The night seemed endless. 
I could remember pacing across the open field in front of the Space Control Center as I thought about the adventures that awaited me in space. I had received several congratulatory messages from my colleagues throughout the entire day, and I was eager to jump into my spacesuit and launch into the vast and mysterious cosmos. My childhood dream was finally coming to life. I had left Kevin with my mother, which I had learned kicked the bucket a few months after I left. The morning had brought with it a new ray of hope and excitement as we marched towards the Yugo spaceship, the first of its kind. I could remember my heart racing as we prepared for a liftoff. <laughs> I chuckled. Kevin forced a smile too. I realized that I was still narrating the tale to him. I did a quick double take at him, drifting back into my world of memories. I wasn't exactly sure how I was narrating it, but the thoughts in my head felt real enough. I knew I was doing a good job, and Kevin seemed to listen attentively too. We had spent almost a month in space, and I had slowly gotten used to the routine activities. We were like a family. We all shared what we could and threw nasty jokes at each other whenever we could. Besides, there wasn't really much we had to do anyway. Everyone had settled in and our gazes were fixed on Mars, and we all waited expectantly. I wanted to see the red planet for myself. I'd heard a lot about Mars and I finally had the opportunity to walk on it, but to this day, I've never glimpsed Mars. A small part of my lengthy list of regrets, we never got to our destination. If I had known that was the last time I was going to see most of my team, I would have made them laugh <laughs> even harder. I'll never forget the moment until the day I leave this world. It all happened so fast and I cannot fully recap everything. I was awoken by a loud bang. Something had just collided with our spaceship, sending everyone into an instant pandemonium. I can still remember the look of surprise on Carter's face. He was dumbfounded. He had earlier thought it was an asteroid, but it didn't make any sense. The large rock-like object seemed to move at matching velocity with our spaceship. In all his years of space travel, he had never seen anything like that before. Carter was our pilot and the most experienced member of the crew, but even he was confused. Our confusion grew when gun-like objects emerged from different sides of the strange stone-like spacecraft, which continued to pursue us persistently. We never expected such challenges in our space travel, and so we weren't all prepared for combat. Besides, we didn't even know what the hell was going on, or who we were even fighting against. Carter had wasted no time in guiding Hugo as we pierced through the vast space, attempting to evade the incoming threat but they seemed relentless. The story seemed to have taken another turn. I stared at my son. He surprisingly looked engrossed in my narration. He was staring right back at me. What changed? I asked myself. I tried to explain to him on his last visit, but he had turned a deaf ear to everything I seemed to be saying. I was glad he had changed his mind. What were they? What did you guys do? Kevin began to play me with several questions. I was glad. This showed that he was actually listening. We, we couldn't do anything. I continued. A few other similar structures appeared from the dark space and we had no way of defending ourselves against them. They soon began to shoot at us. It looked like some sort of laser, but every shot that hit our ship melted it like a chemical. We all watched in dread as our spaceship was slowly destroyed by the strange invaders, but that was not what really creeped the hell out of us. It was the uncertainty of what was happening. We were just astronauts on a journey to Mars to deliver special equipment and return home to our families. We never expected or signed up for an all-out war against anything at all. It seemed like a bad dream and I wanted to wake up. We had put on our spacesuits and braced ourselves for the worst. I can remember asking myself weird questions if this was a spaceship of some sort because it looked very unearthly. I began to wonder if perhaps we were alone in the universe. Our spaceship finally came to a halt and they stopped shooting 
had slowly approached us when they noticed that we weren't fighting back. Our ship now hovered in space and we stood in front of an open hole in our spaceship which had been carved out from their persistent shooting, watching them approach from afar. If I had known that Carter had some stupid plan down his sleeve, I would have probably killed him myself. Out of nowhere, Carter emerged with a strange weapon and fired it towards the incoming rock-like structure which we had all concluded was some sort of spaceship, destroying it. A mix of shock and fear had crowded my face. We were surrounded and we didn't even know how many more were out there. We soon got to know how many more were out there anyway. Carter surprised us all. I could remember wondering what Carter was doing and where he had gotten such a complex weapon. Just one shot had taken out one of their ships. A thought immediately crossed my mind though. I was so enthusiastic about my space travel that I had failed to find out what equipment we were delivering to the astronauts on Mars. <sighs> whatever was in those spaceships did not come for us, no. They came for whatever we were transporting and the only person who seemed to know what was in those crates was Carter. Until this day, I never found out and I never got a chance to ask him. He kept on taking out most of their ships with this special weapon. One of the other crew members, Ian, had asked him if there were more, but he had remained quiet. He was definitely hiding something. A secret so huge that it had attracted trouble. Whatever was hidden in those crates was important enough to attract such massive forces against us. The aliens suddenly resumed their shooting. I threw myself to the floor and lunged for any safe spot I could find. Carter had become their main target, and even though he tried to evade their wrath, he was too slow. I watched him melt like a candle right before my eyes. It was so sudden that I didn't have enough time to process what was going on. Explosions began to erupt all around our precious spacecraft. I sought refuge somewhere safe, but I found none. Tears hugged my cheeks as I trembled in fear. I thought about you, Kevin. I shifted my gaze once again to Kevin. He still seemed captivated by my tail. I swallowed hard and returned to my storytelling. The shocking turn of events had left me confused and all I could do was crouch patiently somewhere on our already wrecked spacecraft. I could hear the distant screams of the rest of the crew. I sobbed softly under my space helmet as I stared at whatever was left of Carter. One of their spaceships soon arrived right in front of me as the rock-like structure opened from its side. <laughs> revealing a strange life form that continues to haunt my thoughts until this very day. What did you see? Kevin asked. I forgot that I was narrating my experience to my son. I kept on drifting into thoughts as my lips danced to the rhythm of my mind. I heaved a heavy sigh. I couldn't describe what my eyes were staring at until a few days later. I can remember letting out a dying scream and immediately losing consciousness. I'd already seen enough to take in for an entire lifetime, and I had finally gotten to the height of it. Uh, I was probably out for a few hours. Time works differently over there. It's much slower compared to Earth, and we were definitely not on Mars. I can't seem to calculate how much time I had spent over there, as time is not calculated by the apparent sunrise and sunset. Somehow, we survive on a strange planet. The planet has so many similarities with Earth, and I believe that's why we were able to survive. We could breathe and live. I opened my eyes to the realization that I was still alive. I, I didn't understand why they had let me live, or us. Morgan was there with me. He was terribly injured, although he would survive and go on to become my best friend. He had helped me escape at the cost of his life. As my thoughts trailed back to Morgan, I couldn't control hot tears from flowing down my cheeks. It's been three years, but it still hurts. He was the one who discovered their secret portal, studied their communication patterns, and also stole their spaceship. We were, however, caught quite early and they gave chase. Morgan had decided to stay back and destroy their portal shortly after I went through to ensure that they didn't get to me. I feel like I owe him a favor and 
I know that this story is not over yet. There's something big happening on Mars that they're hiding from us. I learned that another group of astronauts launched to Mars a few months ago. They're building something, Kevin. Whatever we were transporting was not Earth technology. It was something more advanced. There's the reason the Zodiacs attacked. Zodiacs? Kevin interrupted. Well, that's what Morgan always called them. He once explained to me, but I was always a poor listener. Something about their origin starting from a different star and some advanced cosmology stuff. I forced a smile. Kevin smiled too. I wish this moment never ended. It had been a long time since I had spoken to my son in this manner. The moment was priceless. What happened next? Kevin was eager to discover what had happened. I stared out my window. It was already getting late and I immediately shifted my gaze back to Kevin. He knew what I was planning on saying next. He shook his head. He was ready to listen to the end and so I continued. We were in some sort of deep tunnel. Morgan had explained to me how we got there. They had all flown into a massive portal and emerged on another side of space. He wasn't sure if we were still in our solar system or even in the same galaxy. A few days ago, most of what we knew about space ended up in our Milky Way, but this was beyond any science textbooks on Earth. Aliens? Habitable planets? Earth was still years from this discovery. They had been attempting to make Mars habitable for decades, but there I was, standing on a strange planet filled with life. We remained in the tunnel for what seemed like an endless experience. No food, water, or even shelter. A warm mist seemed to escape from the dark gray soil at regular intervals, and the entire skies were always dark, just like evenings on Earth, although it was still possible to see clearly. We had no idea about how their seasons were, and the only thought on my mind throughout my stay on the planet was getting back home. Morgan managed to somehow trap the mist and convert it into water. I would never have made it out without him. I had once asked him if he had any idea of what we were transporting, but he seemed to be as oblivious as I was. Our next mission was finding a way out of the tunnel. We didn't know why we were left in the tunnel, but we didn't care too much about it. We just wanted a way out. What did the aliens look like? Kevin asked again. I knew he was going to ask me that question eventually, and I thought for the perfect description. My countenance had begun to change. I knew it was no coincidence. There was a huge missing piece in a grander puzzle that our world was oblivious to, and it hunted my very dreams. They look just like us, Kevin. Kevin couldn't hide his surprise. What? Like us? What do you mean? I could see distrust cloud his face and he began to search my eyes for a lie. He found none. Yes, they appear just like us, Kevin, but devolved. They have arms and legs just like we do, but their faces look dead and deformed. They have a dark green appearance and a few of them use both their arms and legs for motion. There was something wrong with the way they looked. They look like some sort of god-forsaken mistake. It also took me a while to believe what I had seen, but I had to accept it. They look like human deviants, as though their genes had been greatly corrupted, like test subjects used in perfecting the human species, but they are a much faster and intelligent species than us. They seem to be eons ahead of us in technology. The look on Kevin's face showed that he wasn't still convinced. Kevin, you have to trust me, I added. I'm telling the truth. I have a feeling Cosmos knew about these species before sending us out into space. Whatever equipment Carter used to fight back against the aliens was definitely built for something much more than basic earthly wars. What happened next? Kevin wanted me to continue. One of the creatures soon came crawling to our hole and only when it came close did I realize that Morgan had been carving out a crude weapon from the hard rock on the floor. He rushed towards the creature in a flash and stabbed it right on his chest. The creature gave a loud screech before dropping stone cold on the ground. They could die just as we did. I was caught by surprise. Of course, 
Morgan was once in the military before joining Cosmos back on Earth, but that was the first time I had seen him in action. He probably wanted to know how to kill the creatures, and he had succeeded. Cosmos is the privately owned space company that had sent us on a mission to Mars to deliver the equipment. They never told us what was contained inside and no one seemed to ask. They had sent a previous team who had successfully established a temporary camp on Mars. They were obviously building something bigger than we could imagine. He had a few untreated wounds, but he still managed to take down one of the creatures with perfect dexterity. He was always cheerful and looked as though he could hardly hurt a fly. And I was there, sulking about my situation. But Morgan had already began to map his way out of the tunnel. I wondered what other crazy ideas he had hidden under his sleeve. I would soon get to find out anyway. It wasn't long before he found a way to get us both out of the tunnel and the shocking sight that greeted my eyes left me bewildered. My jaws had dropped when I saw their level of advancement. They lived in flying castles and transported with portals. This was beyond anything I had seen on earth. Their looks didn't speak much about their sense of development. They looked like devolved species, not unevolved species, and I was baffled at how they had managed to carve out such a massive and impressive empire. We had just barely celebrated our newly found freedom when several spaceships surrounded us. I couldn't believe what had happened. Perhaps the screams of the creature which Morgan had killed alerted them. Morgan knew what was coming. He told me to prepare myself, but even though we were surrounded by the Zodiacs once again, I could still sense hope and a plan masked beneath the seriousness of his voice. That was the beginning of my end. We were both carted away into their central city. I wasn't sure why they kept us alive or what they were planning to do to us, but I knew that Morgan was planning something. A troubling thought strolled across my mind when I was being carted away, but I shoved it off. I had been waiting for a few hours and darkness had already blanketed the skies. The clinic guard stood at the door. He was ready to escort me back into my room. Kevin strolled towards him and whispered a few words into his ears, and he disappeared into the dark corridor. How did you guys make it out? Kevin asked. According to Morgan, the Zodiacs wanted something from us, but it wasn't in the Yugo spaceship. They had missed it. It was on the first ships to Mars, but they didn't know that. They wanted to know where it was. That's why they kept us in the pit to buy themselves some time. Buy themselves some time? For what? Kevin was now asking a lot of questions. According to Morgan, the Zodiacs are a very inquisitive race and they did not believe in impossibilities. They needed time to enable their technology to sync our language. They wanted to communicate with us. We had gotten out of the pit and killed one of theirs which angered them even further. What seemed like days soon became weeks, and an endless cycle of torture. I revealed the markings on my body to Kevin. He seemed terrified. H how did they torture you? I could feel the emotion in Kevin's voice. They injected something inside of us and had to dig deep and wide into our flesh sometimes. It felt like a thousand fires burning inside of me. That was the most agonizing form of torture anyone could face. I wanted death so much, Kevin. What do they want on Mars? Kevin interrupted again. I'm not sure, I replied. One thing I know is that whatever they had come for is important enough to have gained their total focus. I had sworn to discover what Cosmos was planning if I survived and returned to Earth, but I was broken when I returned. I was shocked by how fast time had moved on Earth. I know we had spent quite some time on their planet, but it didn't seem like three years. I turned to Kevin as tears strolled down my cheeks once again. Look at me, Kevin. I'm like a shadow of myself. Even if I discover what they are hiding on Mars, <laughs> what would I be able to do about it? Everyone thinks I'm crazy. <laughs> I had promised to honor Morgan's memory, but I had failed. I'm a coward. Kevin understood what I was going through, but he kept on asking a series of questions. Did the Zodiac eventually sync with our language? Kevin had been throwing several questions at me for the past hour, and he didn't seem ready to stop anytime soon. Yes, they asked for the location of some strange device, but 
Neither of us knew what they were talking about. They thought we did. We were tortured. I had never felt anything like it. The pain seemed endless. I prayed for death, but death had taken another turn. Morgan was also being tortured. I could hear his screams ah! echo throughout their walls. Somehow, whatever substance they injected us seemed to preserve us. We didn't need food or water. To this day, I don't know what they injected into us, but it felt like hell. I had almost given up all hope when Morgan suddenly showed up. I didn't know how he had escaped, but I didn't care either. I just wanted to be free from the intense agony, and I was glad that he was free. Morgan had already mapped out a perfect plan. I opened my hands, revealing the strange, unearthly object to Kevin. Morgan gave me this. I still don't know what I meant to do with it, but I've treasured it ever since. It's the last memory I have of Morgan. What happened to him? I was finally approaching the end of the tale, and I was glad Kevin still believed in my every word. He was the first person who didn't think I was a lunatic after narrating my experience. Morgan had discovered a lot about the Zodiacs in a short time. I'm still baffled at how he had managed to do that. We were both captured and tortured for days and months. I couldn't keep track of time, but when he showed up, he knew exactly what to do. He set me free, stole their rock-like spaceships, and even succeeded in activating the same portal that connected their world to ours, the same way we had entered their planet. They soon detected Morgan's bravado and gave chase. Morgan decided to turn back and destroy the portal. I would never have made it back without what he did. I was still speaking when a familiar figure emerged from the dark corridor behind Kevin. As my eyes shot wide open, I stood abruptly to my feet in shock. M M morgan I stammered. I always had a feeling that he was going to survive. You're alive! Morgan, you're alive! A mix of emotions clouded my thoughts. Joy, disappointment, fear, and confidence. I rushed towards him and gave him a warm embrace. I shifted my gaze towards Kevin in confusion. He knew the question that plagued my heart. He came to me a few days ago. I believe you, Dad. I'm sorry for doubting you the first time. I stared at Morgan once again. He knew I had a lot of questions. I know you have a lot of questions, Neo, but we have a lot of work. He stretched out his hand, motioning for the strange object which he had given me earlier before I escaped from the planet. I handed it over to him. It has been three years, but at the moment, it felt like three days. Come on, we need to get you out of here. His words brought a familiar hope again. I had gotten my son and my friend back in one night. What more could I ask for? Kevin guided me slowly as we strolled out of the clinic. I didn't know what Morgan was planning on doing but I was willing to find out for time always tells the best of tales.